Hey everyone, welcome back. Uh, I want to include Daniel in this video because there's a little bit of a story I want to uh, tell you guys about. When we were having lunch in the summer, we were on the deck and we were talking about kind of the most optimal, ideal shape of a speaker. And I don't know if you guys can relate to this, but have you ever saw an object and said, oh, what if that was a speaker? And that's precisely what we did with this uh, cooler. And uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm always looking, um, when I get to, to kind of pick my Joseph Crow audio product that I'm gonna get. <laughs> um, so I'm always wondering what is gonna fit in my, in my uh, house and and what would look good in my placement next to my stereo and so we were we were sitting there on his deck and we were looking at different products around and the sizes and I was kind of pointing out some things that might work and and Troy points out this cooler and he's like would that work and uh, we kind of started looking <laughs> at it and we're like that's actually the perfect size yeah. for what would fit next yeah. to my entertainment console yeah because the, the issue is really we were like looking at it and we had it up on uh, speaker stand and we're like okay that that's about as high as you'd want it and if it's up this high then it's just too visually intrusive into your space it's like kind of like its head is poking out above everything else and so keeping the speaker system low so it doesn't kind of like shout out visually that there's these massive speakers in your living space and so by positioning the super tweeter at the proper listening height at 92 centimeters off the ground then you're actually listening on access to the super tweeter uh, and then the mid-range is is here so I've, I've shown the mid-range um, this is the ES450 and we'll get to this in a bit and in in more into the video but the idea is that the speaker has small stands it has the dual tens it has the ES450 integrated into the front of the speaker and and then there's the small 2258 super tweeter uh, sitting kind of inconspicuously on top. All right, so now we get into the more nerdy part of the video where we talk about uh, the performance data. And so just high level, what we're doing is we're showcasing the new speaker system 2800. And so what I wanna do is talk about why I've done this particular design in terms of the test data, in terms of its visual appearance, uh, in terms of its kind of fitment in your home decor and what I'm personally after. And a lot of times when I do a speaker design, it's, it's specific to what I would want. And I remember watching a, a video on Jay Leno where he was asked about how does he know what cars to collect? And he said, well, I'll talk like Jay Leno. <laughs> uh, he said, it, usually if, if I like a car, um, it's going to end up going up in value because I feel like if I like the car, then other people are going to like it too. And so uh, same thing with the speakers. I feel like I just need to do what I think I would like. And even though it's going off the beaten path, um, I think that other people out there might appreciate what I'm trying to do. Okay, so back to, back to this. So this this speaker is basically joining together two speakers that I currently offer. The 1680, which is a 10-inch two-way, and then the 2095 speaker, which is a 15-inch back-loaded horn three-way. Okay, and so recently we had done three pair of the 2095, and I'll touch on some of the reviews that I received from the specific customers on those projects, because it ties into uh, why we're going with the particular mid-range, the particular super tweeter, uh, but back to the 1680, the 10-inch 2A. So that has a beautiful kind of male vocal, very warm, dynamic, room-filling presence to the sound. And so we wanted to take that and just expand on it further by adding more dynamic headroom, by adding the dual 10-inch. It uses the same 10-inch as the 1680, but in a dual horizontal setup. And so this stems from a test that I had done a few months ago where I had taken a single 8 inch kind of cube and set it down on the ground and then set the, SPL, the test SPL at 95 dB and so I measured the distortion of a single 8 inch uh, and then decided to, to compare what would happen to the distortion level uh, if we had added a second 
eight inch enclosure on top vertically arranged and so I remeasured the distortion and I calibrated it to the exact same 95 dB test SPL. So the math there is that if you add another woofer you're going to get a 3 dB improvement in the distortion. So and that's exactly what I found when arranging the woofers vertically. However, something happened when I did the test with the woofers horizontal and there was actually a 13 dB improvement in the bass performance. And I can speculate as to how that's occurring. It may be that there's boundary reinforcement from the floor occurring where you're getting even more uh, output and so there is uh, what I would call a mutual coupling effect of the woofers when they're flanked horizontally in that way and so that's the basis of this design we took that experiment and then that drove the design decision to do uh, this particular arrangement we have dual tens okay so um, we built these cabinets uh, to test that further to see where they would end up in terms of distortion. And so the question is, well, where is a reasonable place to be for harmonic distortion? And so considering that these speakers are, you know, the joining of the 1680 and the 2095, I didn't want to have any worse distortion than the 2095 because that was kind of the, the target there. We didn't want to compromise that. And so comparing distortion data against the 2095 with this, it actually achieves uh, the same distortion. So uh, excellent result there in the sense that the cabinet is significantly smaller than the 2095 and so you're getting the same bass performance uh, from this 2800 in the smaller size format. So the next uh, kind of big factor for my customers, and I would say 90% of my customers are using low power single-ended triode tube amps. And that was, um, I can get into that in, in the testimonials with the 2095 speaker, but the main thing is that we need to have very high, not just sensitivity, but efficiency. And efficiency is, is specifically how much does, how much output does the speaker provide with one watt and the, the sensitivity specification is more about the output of the driver at 2.83 volts and so what I to kind of spell this out in a more clearer fashion um, I did a, a chart here that shows you uh, the sensitivity of a single woofer and then if you add a second woofer in either series or parallel how does the sensitivity uh, how is that affected? And so you can see here on the graph, um, when you take a second woofer and you wire it in parallel, you're going to get a 6 dB increase in the sensitivity specification. If you wire those two woofers in series, then there's going to be no increase in the sensitivity specification. However, if you look at the far right column for the actual output power in watts required for those three different configurations, you can see that for the parallel wiring, you actually require 2.54 watts to achieve that specific sensitivity. And so in terms of those users of low power tube amps, what we really want to know is the efficiency of the speaker. To clarify this even further, here's a graph of the same configurations but with the output power fixed at one watt. So you can see in the right hand column those three scenarios are fixed at one watt. And so now the resulting sensitivity for both the parallel and the series wiring is the same. So now you're left with a question of, okay, we have 95.2 dB sensitivity anechoic from these, this, these two 10 inch woofers, which one would be best again for those using low power tube amps? So here's a third graph that kind of spells it out even further. I've added a, um, another column that's the actual load on the amplifier. And so you can see here that for the series wiring, it's a 12.6 uh, ohm load, um, being a 16 ohm load being wired in series. And so what does this mean for 
tube amplifier users. It means that you can actually use the 16 ohm output taps on your tube amp and it's going to be a much easier load for your tube amp so you're going to have less windings, lower distortion. Again, just I think it's generally known that having uh, a 16 ohm speaker is going to be much uh, easier for those using uh, tube amps. And so the idea that's a very long-winded way of uh, explaining that this speaker can actually be 16 ohm. Uh, hopefully your amplifier has a 16 ohm tap um, and it also provides 95 dB sensitivity anechoic which is going to be around 102 uh, in room or how other a lot of other companies like to specify um, the in-room response such as Klipsch who specifies it that way. So. Um, I want to go back to um, discussing the mid-range and treble aspect of the speaker and so I'm going to go to the testimonials. So um, the specific customer, Robert, he received the 2095 speaker and so what he, I'll post the, his review there if you want to uh, just pause the video and read what he has to say about his listening impressions on the 2095 speaker. And so the 2095 speaker uses the ES400 biradial, which which has a 450 hertz cutoff, and it uses uh, the DCM uh, BNC DCM50 compression driver. It's a two-inch compression driver, and it has a five-inch paper diaphragm. And so this is basically the pick of the litter in terms of overall musicality and it not being uh, harsh on difficult recordings. So it seems to do everything well in terms of clarity, in terms of uh, dynamics, and so we've uh, used the DCM50 on the 2095 speakers and it just has this warm sound character. It covers from about 500 hertz all the way up to 10 kilohertz. Uh, where it falls off sharply. Now that actually works to our advantage in that we can then come in with the 2258 Super Tweeter and provides uh, symmetrical crossover slopes at that 10 kilohertz region. And so because it's physically uh, time aligned, so it goes here, it's physically time aligned in terms of the depth and also we have very close driver spacing uh, because of the biradial configuration. The uh, 2258 Super Tweeter comes in beautifully and provides very um, coherent sound. It doesn't um, have the crossover point in the vocal range. So the nice thing is, is that the DCM50 is basically like a full range driver in the sense that it's providing um, coverage through the entire vocal range from about 500 hertz up to 10 kilohertz. So in, in terms of coherency, uh, this is rivals um, what you would typically get with like a coaxial driver. So this video is more about kind of an update on where we're at with this design. So we built the test enclosures, we tested the distortion performance like I said. Um, we have the ES450 here in inventory to test and then if it proves out that it's, you know, a match made in heaven, then I am going to machine a horn that actually mounts into the front baffle. And so we're currently kind of in the development stage and I just wanted to feature this video to kind of get ahead and show you guys what we're doing. And so here's a picture of the finished product fully designed in SolidWorks on what I hope for it to look like. All right, so just to wrap up this, I, it's funny because I have heard, I've talked to my customers on the phone and one of the comments that they make is they can't, people come in and they, they immediately start touching the speaker. <laughs> <laughs> that was a comment. I can totally relate to that in that um, you just like touching the speaker. It's like real wood, right? So, but anyways, that's quite a tangent. Uh, this is the prototype cabinets and so the next step is to set up just temporarily the ES450 as a stereo pair in my listening space for extended critical listening and to come up you know with the passive crossover and then following that the goal would be to remove the baffle off the prototype speakers and then 
uh, machine the proper horn that integrates into the front of the speaker. Uh, something that I didn't really touch on was when we built the prototype cabinet, we simulated the ports as far as the diameter of the ports and the length and that to come up with the tuning frequency. The tuning frequency is supposed to be 38 hertz. And so what we found was is that when we really pumped the power into the speakers, you know, around the 200 watt range, we were getting some port noise. And so luckily we have the 3D printers here and we were able to print out various port geometries with different flare geometries. And we ended up by the fourth revision coming up with something that actually has zero port noise as far as the chuffing sound and that. And so uh, we wanted to make the ports as small as reasonably possible just because what I've found in my experience is that the smaller ports reduce the amount of mid-range energy that's escaping uh, from inside the cabinet through the ports. And so by kind of restricting the port diameter but also giving it a geometry that does not introduce any kind of port noise noise was the goal with these speakers. So we came up with a rather, a rather unorthodox port geometry, uh, but there it is. So uh, let me know, here's the render of the finished 2800 speaker. Um, it's a take on kind of the classic studio, large scale studio monitor. Uh, let me know in the comments what you think. This is again uh, an amalgamation of our best designs uh, coming up with something that takes it even further. So take care and have a great day. Okay.